Okay. Well, you touched on it just for a second. You said the word, which is something that I just love so much. And if there's anything bad about it, I'm just going to have to chalk it up. Like I'm willing to do really about anything except for in this one specific area to be more healthy, to have more longevity, to optimize my hormones, optimize um, energy. Um, But when it comes to coffee, I got to have coffee. Um, I went without coffee last year for about two and a half months. I just stopped and I had no problem. I didn't have a single headache from it. I wasn't less energetic. I just love coffee. And so tell me the, the good and the bad and what is sort of like the optimal way to consume it. And I'm sure I'm going to have more questions about it, but let's just start there. Yeah. You know, I I don't think coffee is as bad as some people present it to be. Um, The coffee that I I think it's really the timing of the coffee consumption. So for example, um, we're recording this at at one o'clock Pacific Standard Time. I would definitely not advise you have coffee after this point in the day. Um, Now, if you're going to go do a hard workout, if you're like, oh my gosh, I haven't seen my girlfriends in like three months, we're going to go out tonight, find a little caffeine. But caffeine really is problematic for um, helping you fall asleep. It, 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 you know, disturbs um, all the adenosine metabolism in the brain. So it's going to uh, augment sleep. And so that's not good. But I'm a fan, especially, you know, we were talking before we started recording about Maybe a wedding's coming up, losing a little weight. You know, a lot of people have, you know, these want to get in shape for summer. Using caffeine before you exercise has been shown to prevent the catabolism or the breakdown of muscle, which is a good thing, and enhance the oxidation of fat. So uh, in the morning, I'm a big fan of that. And that's, I do a double espresso. And when when choosing the beans, I'm a bigger fan of an organic light roast. Mm. Uh, and there's a few different reasons for that. But um, that's what I preferentially choose. Um, I periodically will have just say USP caffeine in, in the form of like a pre-workout. But I try to use that sparingly. It, that's sort of like, oh my gosh, you know, I'm, I'm doing something extra intense today or something's going on where I need a little, but I, I really advise people not be dependent upon pre-workouts and sure. straight up caffeine and use use coffee um, as a little, a little tool. But where people get into problems with coffee is they have the coffee, then they have the the stevia packets or they have Splenda or they have a bunch of sugar um, and it becomes basically a four or five, 600 calorie energy bomb, which that can add up, you know, you add in three meals there, plus some wine, plus some beer, you're looking at three to 4,000 calories. And unless you're really active, you're probably going to gain some weight. So those are my thoughts on coffee. Well, I drink it black, total purist. Um, so you talked about the timing and this is cause I've read a lot and watched a lot of videos about coffee and timing and sunlight and you know, uh, that there, that your body, um, has sort of the natural energy from waking up. And is that cortisol that produces that and kind of gives you a burst and that it really, you should wait at least an hour, perhaps after you wake up to drink it. Me, I, I wake up, I force myself to drink a glass of water and I actually put right now, I put, um, some aloe vera water, aloe vera in it. And then, um, I put a little bit of lemon juice and some apple cider vinegar, just, just a little bit. And so I force myself, I drink that or just regular water, but then I'm ready for coffee. And that might only be like 30, 40 minutes after I wake up, maybe. You know, I think that's fine. I know a lot of people do split hairs on having to wait (sighs) this amount of time in this, you know, some days that's not practical. I mean, if you're going off to travel or you're doing something, um, but if it makes my, my, my thing is like, if it makes you feel good and it's, you know, there's not a lot of downside. So you're like, okay, if you only wait 45 minutes, what's the worst that's going to happen? Your, your cortisol awakening and response, which is theoretically why people are saying delay the onset of coffee, should already be kicking in even before you wake up. That should be mm-hmm. sort of waking, wake, awakening you. So I don't worry about that. There's other things that I worry about. I would, you know, 
And if we're too regimented, this is another thing. If, we're, we're too, if we exert too much willpower, oh, I'm only going to consume this much coffee. I'm going to meditate. I got to exercise. I can't have sugar. I can't do this. Then by the time it's 10 o'clock, you're like, oh my gosh, forget it. I, I need that glass of wine or I need some ice cream. So we need to be mindful about how much willpower we're, and how much restraint we're sort of inserting into our day. Um, and so I think you know, having low coffee, not a big deal if it's within a half an hour, 40 minutes of awakening. Sure, sure. Um, I, this is a, a little bit of a side question to the coffee, but sort of in, in light of getting sunlight in the morning, I have a big, you know, juve, like six panel red light. And, um, and I, I think I kind of know the answer, but I'm curious from a scientific standpoint, sometimes I think to myself, oh man, especially right now in Arizona, it's like, sunny at 5 a.m. <laughs> it's getting sunny. And I know that because that's when I wake up because I wake up with the light. And I think, well, should I do the red light? Because normally my routine would be to get up, have that water, a little bit of coffee, red light, stretch, a little bit of yoga during that dry brush, cold shower, get some clothes on, go walk the dogs. That's kind of my normal routine. But I'm like, man, I probably should just skip the red light and just get outside. Like it's, it's like, is that accurate or is there some benefit with red light specifically? Is there more um, density of those wavelengths that it's giving you that helps with the mitochondria and other kinds of things that it's meant to improve or should you just get outside? It's a great question. I think this time of year, you should just get outside. Yeah. Um, especially for you, it's starting to get warmer and warmer and then you may not be outside in the middle part of the day. So I think that's more important. Um, there are definitely some mitochondrial benefits with regards to, and I, I we too have the six panel juve and it's yeah. an awesome right. setup, right? Um, but I, I consider that more therapeutic in the winter time specifically. You mentioned how in the heck do you survive in Seattle? Like yeah. that is because sometimes it doesn't get light out until eight thirty. You know, um, like, and that's really tough. So that's where I think the juve comes in, and also it can help with an injury. Let's say, for example, you're like, well, I have a bicep injury, or you know, was training, had some challenges. Um, I, I know you recently got into. A, a, an, an accident, right? There was a spinning situation going on. So maybe that could help with the recovery. Then you go outside. But, but I think if you're going to, you know, I would definitely prefer the sun over the juve as much as I love the juve. I'm going to have a lot of questions about fasting, but first I want to start off with just being a fat burner versus a sugar burner. And I get that you know, once you become more metabolically flexible, you should be able to kind of tap into either. And then perhaps you're not as hungry as often because your body is adapted and it can shift sort of um, energy mechanisms. But how the hell do you know if you're burning fat or sugar? Because I get hungry and I try, I mean, I try at minimum of 12 hours. Um, and then sometimes, you know, a little bit more depending on the situation or the um, the time of the month. But um, but what, how do we know when we're burning fat versus sugar? The really practical way to do this is actually to test and you can get a glucometer. Mm -hmm. And I encourage all my clients to do this is just go down to Walgreens or Rite Aid or your closest drugstore. People think, oh, a glucose meter, that's only for diabetics. No, this is for everyone. We need to know how our body is processing the foods that we eat. And we need to know how our lifestyle is impacting the post-meal processing. So um, you mentioned like even if you eat a low-carb diet, uh, for example, but most people in the post-meal window, their blood sugar is going to go up. So you're naturally going to sort of oxidize or burn more glucose in the post-meal window. But most Americans, unfortunately, stay in that state because not only are, are they eating foods that dramatically increase the glucose, but they're snacking every two to three hours or more. And so the glucose is, they're always sort of oxidizing or burning glucose and never get to the point to where maybe you or I would be in because we exercise and because we compress that feeding window, aka we fast, we get to the point where the glucose goes down and the body needs energy and it starts to dip into the fat stores. And we can talk about hormonally why that happens. But to specifically, again, address the question, how do you know? You would get a glucose meter. You would start to test your glucose. And about, you could do like 30 minutes after. It's just a little finger prick, 29 gauge. It stings a little bit, but it's no big deal. So you could test your glucose again, 30 minutes after a meal, 60 minutes after the meal, and 90 minutes. And you should see that glucose starting to come down. 
And that would indicate that as glucose comes down, then you start, you're, you should start to oxidize fats for fuel uh, in the okay. post meal window.